on World News Tonight. Minister killed. Ukraine's Minister of the Interior was amongst the casualties of a helicopter crash. Was Russia involved? Find out tonight. Economic slump. China's GDP suffers a painfully slow pace of expansion stemming from abrupt COVID policy decisions. Swift resignation. Vietnam's president steps down from power in a shift in leadership among country's leaders. And celebrating culture. China's Spring Festival Gala ramps up preparations with the inclusion of historical displays and performances. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and thank you for joining us once more on World News Tonight. Now we have a number of comprehensive coverages lined up for you tonight. But before we begin with any of those, we have breaking news for you tonight. A magnitude 7 earthquake struck off Indonesia's Sulawesi Island today, prompting panicked residents in some towns nearest to the epicenter to flee buildings and with the tremor felt in the neighboring Philippines. Despite there being multiple tsunami warnings of the time, later on Indonesia's geophysics agency said there was no risk of a tsunami and the US-based Pacific Tsunami Warning Center in a bulletin also called off an earlier warning of a tsunami risk. The geophysics agency said the quake's epicenter at a depth of 64 kilometers and 141 kilometers southeast of the town of Melangwan and reported 10 aftershocks. A resident in Manado, the capital of North Sulawesi province, also said by telephone that the quake was felt very strongly for several seconds and people were seen running out of buildings before later returning. Now, the head of Ukraine's National Police, Igor Klemenko, said 16 people, including Ukraine's interior minister and two children, were killed when a helicopter crashed near a nursery outside the capital, Kiev. Among the dead are several top officials of the interior ministry, including interior minister Denis Monsteriski. Officials did not give an immediate explanation of the cause of the helicopter crash. There was no immediate comment from Russia, whose troops invaded Ukraine last February, and Ukrainian officials made no reference to any Russian attack in the area at the time. The death toll in the helicopter crash in Bovare has risen to 18, according to the head of the Kyiv Regional Military Administration. Oleksiy Kuleba wrote on Telegram that three of those killed were children following the crash near a kindergarten and residential building in the Kyiv suburbs. Kuleba added that 29 people were injured, including 15 children. According to Kuleba, helicopter pilots know the area they fly in and the potential obstacles regardless of weather conditions. The Ukrainian government was also avoiding commenting on the nature of the mission that required the presence of senior interior ministry officials aboard the helicopter. U.S. and European airlines will benefit from pent-up demand for travel to China after its recent border reopening, but route approvals and not enough large aircraft remain barriers to rising sales. Chinese airports are bustling as people head home for the Lunar New Year holidays. But international terminals are getting busier too as the country reopens to travellers from abroad. That should spell good news for the world's airlines. Booking site Expedia says searches for flights to China doubled after the reopening was announced. But industry experts aren't so sure that Western carriers will see quick benefits. Adding new flights to the country requires regulatory approval, which may be slow to come at a time of US-China tensions. Right now, United Airlines can only fly four times a week from the US to mainland China. Back in January 2019, it operated 584 services to the country. American Airlines and Delta are both taking a cautious approach to rebuilding routes to China. A shortage of planes may also be a factor. Analysts say US and European carriers may prioritise lucrative transatlantic routes for their big jets. That may not leave enough to ramp up China flights. They also face a disadvantage against Chinese rivals, who are still free to use Russian airspace. That allows them to shave hours off some routes, saving money and time. For now, that all leaves capacity running short of demand, with predictable effects on ticket prices. Data firm Ford Keys says airfares from China are now 160% up on pre-health crisis levels. 
That could mean profit for airlines with seats to sell, but pain for hopeful travellers. Meanwhile, China's GDP has expanded at its slowest pace since the mid-1970s by the COVID hit 2020 year, as the world's second largest economy struggled under tight pandemic restrictions that were abruptly ditched late in 2022. China's economic growth in 2022 slumped to one of its worst levels in nearly half a century. Data released from the National Bureau of Statistics on Tuesday showed GDP expanded by 3% last year, badly missing the official target of around 5.5%. The figures highlight how China's economy has been weighed down by stringent COVID curbs and a property market slump. Other indicators such as retail sales and factory output be expectations for December, but was still weak. The data puts pressure on policymakers in Beijing to unveil more stimulus this year. Last month, Beijing abruptly lifted all its strict antivirus measures that had severely restrained economic activity. However, the relaxation has led to a sharp rise in COVID cases that economists say might hamper near-term growth. Also in December, Top leaders pledged to focus on stabilising the economy in 2023 and step up policy support to ensure key targets are hit. Economists are optimistic, anticipating China's growth to rebound this year as it reopens to the world. But policymakers still face a host of challenges, including demographic ones. Tuesday's data revealed China's population to have fallen in 2022 for the first time since 1961 a historic turn that is expected to mark the start of a long period of decline in its citizen numbers. Asian shares dropped after the Chinese data, while the yuan skidded to a one-week low. Now over top the political update in India. The tenure of J.P. Nadda as president of the Bharatiya Janata Party was extended till June 2024 at the party's National Executive Committee meeting, signalling that the ruling party will fight the next general election under the leadership of the 62-year-old leader. Let's cross over to other than a World News Special Correspondent Gathri Gunasekara joining us from Delhi in India. Gathri. Yes, Anuradi. Announcing the decision, Home Minister Amit Shah said the proposal to extend his term was moved by Defence Minister Rajnath Singh and endorsed by the executive panel unanimously. Shah expressed confidence that the BJP will achieve a bigger win than last year's general elections when it won 303 seats in the Lok Sabha. The party is required to carry out a membership drive ahead of organizational polls, but due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the drive was affected and elections at the booth level uh, could not be held. Home Minister also said the elections for the President's post was also affected. The BJP decision to extend Nadda's term uh, ratified by the highest decision-making body, the parliamentary board, will now be conveyed to the Election Commission. Nadda was appointed uh, BJP chief on uh, January 20, 2020. He took over the position after Shah was appointed as Home Minister in 2019. He was first appointed as the party's working president and then given a full three-year term. Shah said Nadda led the organization to carry out relief work with vibrancy and it was under his leadership that the party performed well in states such as Bihar and Maharashtra and made gains in states such as West Bengal. Back to you, Anradi. All right, thank you. That was other than a World News Special Correspondent Gathru Gunasekara reporting from Delhi in India. Now, Vietnam's President Nguyen Xuan Phuc has announced he is stepping down, sparking a potential power shift among the communist rule country's leaders. The move had been widely rumoured and follows the department of two deputy prime ministers who served under him. President Phuc, a former prime minister, had held the post of president since 2021. The news that he is quitting comes during an anti-corruption drive led by hardliners. Hundreds of Communist Party members are being investigated. The president's resignation requires approval from the National Assembly, which will hold an extraordinary vote on Wednesday that is expected to be a formality. Confirmation from Vietnam's official state media said that the president was resigning following weeks of speculation that he would leave his post. A party statement praised President Phuc's leadership but said he was politically responsible for violations and the wrongdoing of numerous officials under him as well as the two deputy prime ministers who resigned earlier this month. Two ministers and other officials are facing criminal charges. 
But hardline General Secretary Nguyen Phu Trong, who was given an unprecedented third term at last year's party congress, appears to be consolidating his authority by ousting senior officials seen as more pro-Western and pro-business. Officially, this is all happening in the same name of fighting corruption, a big problem in Vietnam, but it's indicative of a power struggle at the top of the party which permits no challenges to its monopoly on power. It's unlikely to change Vietnam's overall trajectory, with the emphasis still on encouraging foreign investment to keep up the breakneck pace of economic growth and on steering a delicate diplomatic path between China and the United States. But the likely rise now of more security-focused officials to the top of the party will be bad news for human rights and for those few Vietnamese brave enough to criticize the party. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, over in the U.S., there is still no comment from U.S. President Biden about the special counsel investigation into whether he mishandled classified material. But the White House is firing back at some of the growing criticism. President Biden again refusing to answer questions about the swirling controversy over his handling of classified documents. Will you commit to speak to the special counsel? For the fifth day in a row, no comment as he faces a special counsel investigation and intensifying bipartisan criticism for a lack of transparency and the ongoing drip, drip, drip of new information. Days after announcing the search for classified documents was complete, just this weekend the White House revealed five more pages of classified materials were among those discovered at the president's Delaware home. The first batch of classified materials, including at least one top secret document, was found at the president's former private office. And Biden lawyers found more documents at the Biden's Delaware home, including inside the garage. Republicans are accusing the president of hypocrisy since he blasted former President Trump for keeping hundreds of classified documents at his Mar-a-Lago home. How that could possibly happen. How one, anyone could be that irresponsible. But tonight, the White House is firing back, arguing unlike Mr. Trump's case, President Biden's lawyers handed back all classified documents as soon as they were found, accusing Republicans of faking outrage. The White House is leaving many questions unanswered, among them exactly how many classified documents of Biden lawyers recovered, who had access to them. And why was the public not told for more than two months that Biden lawyers had found classified documents before the midterms? South Korea's indigenously developed fighter jet, the KF-12 Boramai, has successfully flown faster than the speed of sound. It achieved the milestone in a test flight just yesterday. Just six months after its first test flight, the first fighter jet built independently by South Korea has gone supersonic. According to the Defense Acquisition Program Administration, the first prototype of the KF-21 Porama aircraft surpassed the speed of sound, Mach 1, or about 1,200 km per hour, for the first time on Tuesday. Taking off from Sachan Air Base, the prototype flew at an altitude of about 40,000 feet over the country's southern waters and reached the milestone speed at around 3.15 p.m. Defense officials say the successful supersonic flight confirmed the aircraft's structural stability. It was able to withstand shockwaves and unstable airflow that typically hit the body of an aircraft when it breaks through the sound barrier. The test flight also marks the first for South Korea's defense industry, as the KF-21 is the country's first fighter jet developed completely with domestic technology. Defense Minister Lee jong sub called the flight a historic achievement, saying it lays the foundation for a stronger military, as well as paving the way for South Korea to become a major arms exporter. Seoul has been working on the KF-21 since 2015, pouring more than 7 billion US dollars into the project. It began flight tests in July last year. Having conducted more than 80 sorties so far, developers say they will continue to increase the altitude and speed of the aircraft as well as improve flight stability to make the KF-21 a full-fledged supersonic fighter. The country aims to finish developing the aircraft by 2026.
Now, over in Iran, executions of protesters and a British-Iranian dual national have fueled anger against the Iranian regime, but demonstrations on the ground have reduced in number. Instead, they've moved online to call for the Revolutionary Guard to be recognized as terrorists, posting the hashtag IRGC terrorists more than 27 million times for two days in a row. The following visuals of this story is graphic. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. In Tehran, the roads are perilous, but anti-government protests are far more dangerous. That's why people chose unconventional ways to commemorate the life of Mohsen Shikari, the first protester to be executed by the regime. The mullahs are losing patience with the protesters, so this revolt is moving online. It's painful, it's burning, says this student, Elaha Tavakolian, who was shot in the eye during a protest in Tehran. She posted a video of herself in the recovery room, hashtag, you targeted my eye, but my heart is still beating, along with considered pictures of her recovery. Her social media page turned into a tool to challenge the regime. Members of Iran's notorious Revolutionary Guard, or IRGC, have been singled out on the internet for the brutal treatment of peaceful protesters. The protesters have won support worldwide, a hashtag campaign promoting this rally in Strasbourg. But will their efforts weaken the regime? Greta Thunberg's calls for preventing coal mine expansion in Germany has uh, briefly detained as German authorities restrain the activists along with the rest of her group. The activist group is now in the process of being released following ID authentication, among other checks. World-renowned climate activist Greta Thunberg was briefly detained in Germany on Tuesday, alongside others protesting against the demolition of a village to make way for a coal mine expansion. Yes, Thunberg was removed by officers after sitting with a group of protesters near the edge of the Gartzweiler II lignite coal mine, about five and a half miles from the village of Luetzerath. The village is to be raised as part of an agreement between the government and Germany energy utility RWE. The deal saves five other villages once slated for destruction. The German government has said it needs the mine for the nation's energy security. But opponents say Germany should not be mining any more lignite and should focus on expanding renewable energy instead. Riot police backed by bulldozers removed activists from buildings in the village. But protesters, including Thunberg, remained at the site, staging a sit-in into Tuesday, sitting alone in a large police bus after having been detained. Police said Thunberg and her group were released later in the day. The fact that all of you are here is a sign of hope. The Swedish climate activists addressed the around 6,000 protesters who marched towards Luetzerath on Saturday, calling the expansion of the mine a betrayal of present and future generations. Now over in Kasindi, the northeast of the Democratic Republic of Congo, investigations are progressing after a bomb exploded in a Pentecostal church and killed at least 14 people. Congolese police and mine experts from the UN combed the blast area as Uganda forces secured the zone. The death toll from a church bombing in eastern Democratic Republic of Congo has risen to 14, authorities said on Monday. Responsibility for the attack during a Sunday service at a Protestant church in the city of Kasindi has been claimed by Islamic State. Hundreds had gathered for a series of baptisms at the church, with the congregation swelling to the extent that the service was moved outside. Ten minutes into proceedings, a blast shook the courtyard where worshippers were gathered, according to witnesses. Dozens, like Aileen Pawnee, were wounded with burns and cuts from flying debris. We were listening to the preacher when we heard a loud blast. It threw us to the ground. I was shocked. I started to move to the side. I didn't know I was injured. I saw my neighbour. He was lying on the ground. A motorbike driver picked me up and drove me to the hospital. That's where I realised I was injured. Kasindi is located in a province where Congolese and Ugandan troops have been battling the Allied Democratic Forces, 
It is a Ugandan militant group that pledged loyalty to Islamic State in 2019. ADF has been accused of killing hundreds of villagers, sometimes with machetes, in frequent raids over the past two years. The army blamed ADF for the attack. The group could not be reached for comment and did not claim responsibility. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. A Qantas flight from New Zealand landed at Sydney Airport after it had earlier issued a distress signal. Emergency vehicles which were on standby trailed the QF-144 flight shortly after it touched down on a runway at the airport. British inflation eased last month after hitting a 41-year high in October, offering some comfort to the Bank of England, but pressure on households remained intense as food and drink prices arose at the fastest pace since 1977. The Spanish town of Laredo is battling fast-flowing floodwaters. Northern Canterbury region has suffered two days of heavy rain, causing mass flooding, overflows and the collapse of walls and roads. Jury selection kicked off in a case brought by Tesla shareholders who claimed Elon Musk's 2018 tweet saying funding was secured to take the electric car make a private amounted to fraud. Microsoft plans to cut thousands of jobs with some roles expected to be eliminated in human resources and engineering divisions. The expected payoff would be the latest with Amazon and Meta announcing their own job cuts. Officials of the Australian Open banned Russian and Belarusian flags from the tournament. This follows a courtside incident on Monday when a Russian flag was waved during an opening round women's singles game between Ukraine's Katerina Bind and Russia's Kamila Rakimova. And that is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you miss any of the stories tonight, you can always catch us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other than English. Now with China's Spring Festival Gala fast approaching, cultural performers practice to put on their very best show. We leave you tonight with the intangible cultural heritage programs highlighting the enduring charm of traditional Chinese cultural legacy. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.